CD Projekt Red doesn't do things by halves. With The Witcher 3 it raised the bar for storytelling in video games and released 25 hour expansions that were better than most other complete games from publishers with far larger budgets. Another example is the card game Gwent. After deciding to add a minigame to Witcher 3, CD Projekt Red could have easily churned out something based on the likes of Blackjack or Pontoon with a couple of minor tweaks. You'd play it once or twice because the story makes you and then you never touch it again unless you want to earn some easy money. Instead, the Polish developer created Gwent, a complex card collection game that was entertaining enough to make me stop playing the campaign and sit down for a few rounds of cards. I even bought sets of the physical cards, although of course as with all good collector's items I haven't actually played with them. Gwent was entertaining but flawed. During my Witcher 3 playthrough I created a deck that seemed to be nigh on unbeatable and removed all the challenge and tension from games. Players clamoured for a separate multiplayer release but clearly changes needed to be made before Gwent was ready for a competitive audience. The result of those changes was Gwent, the Witcher card game. It started off being largely multiplayer only but CD Projekt Red promised that a full campaign was on its way. I don't play a lot of collectible card games because I don't get into the competitive multiplayer scene. I've played through a few card game campaigns but they often feel like glorified tutorials to get you into the multiplayer or introduce new cards that you'll then want to chase via paid packs. CD Projekt Red could easily have done something similar and maybe that was the original intention. Thronebreaker wasn't always going to be a separate product but like I said CD Projekt Red doesn't do things by halves. It doesn't know how. I'd usually be suspicious of a publisher splitting out a campaign and selling it for $30 as a separate product. It could easily feel like a cash grab. That is certainly not the case here. The effort put into Thronebreaker is absolutely stunning. From the best in the industry writing to the excellent voice acting and beautiful animations, Thronebreaker exudes quality during its roughly 30 hour duration. Strangely, the one area Thronebreaker falls down in slightly is the game of Gwent itself. There's a lot of battle variety but not much in the way of challenge, at least not on the main path, and I say that as someone who isn't usually good at collectible card games. As a result of the lack of challenge, too many battles ended up lacking the impetus they should have had given what was happening in the story. Still, I absolutely love that story and there were a ton of great puzzle encounters so Thronebreaker gets 4 stars out of 5. This is probably an appropriate time to mention that I received a free review copy from CD Projekt Red. There's a shorter written version of this review available on my website if you'd like to read that instead. Thronebreaker is currently available on PC and is coming to PS4 and Xbox One on December 4th. I'd be amazed if it also doesn't come to Switch and mobile because the interface is perfect for a decent sized touchscreen device. Thronebreaker is set during the Second Northern War between the Northern Realms and Nilfgaard which takes place just before the start of the first Witcher game. The full title is Thronebreaker The Witcher Tales, but to be clear this isn't a story about Geralt or indeed any witches. It's a story that takes place in the same region, it's just not about the witches themselves. Instead you play as Queen Meave, a former Lyrian princess who married the King of Rivia. After the King's death she became Queen of Lyria and Rivia because her son Villain was considered too young and inexperienced to take the throne. Queen Meave is on her way back to Lyria after attending a meeting of northern royalty designed to address the impending threat of a Nilfgaard army to the south led by General Epdahi. The northern rulers agree to come to each other's aid should the need arise, however as Meave points out it is ultimately just a piece of paper. Actions will speak louder than words. Yes, at its end letters were exchanged, documents signed, paper. Time will tell of what value. Meave's son Willem looked after Lyria in her absence along with the council led by Count Caldwell. However, they didn't do a great job. Caldwell went chasing after the strays of Sparla, but they tricked him with decoys while they robbed the royal coffers blind. Meave gets distracted dealing with the strays while the Nilfgaardians invade and take over Lyria as part of a wider invasion of the north. Meave sets out to gather allies and save her son. You absolutely do not need to know the history of the Witcher series, be it games or books, to enjoy Thronebreaker's story. I've only played Witcher 3 and therefore didn't have a lot of context for the events here, but I still thoroughly enjoyed it. There are familiar enemies and characters if you know the world, but don't worry too much about it. There's plenty of world building in Thronebreaker itself to pull you into the story and it was enough to have me downloading the original Witcher when I'd finished. Given that Thronebreaker is effectively a prequel, the major events are largely fixed, however you have plenty of opportunities to change the nature of the journey if not the overall outcome. Queen Meave already has a reputation as a tough ruler, but you can nudge her in certain directions for decisions both big and small. I know it's a bit cliche to say that your choices have consequences and all that, but your choices really do have consequences. After making a decision you're told that you chose one evil over another, and while that is a bit dramatic in some cases it does feel appropriate most of the time. The choices are rarely pleasant to make. For example, the Northern Realm has a problem with racism towards non-humans. I wanted to show support for non-humans and hated the thought of effectively siding with the racists. However, there was nearly always a good argument for treating the non-humans harshly given the circumstances. 
In one case, I saved a village from Nilfgaardians and the locals wanted to repeal the Nilfgaardian rules that they'd been forced to live under. Seemed like an easy decision, except those rules forced humans to accept non-humans as part of their village and government. The humans wanted to go back to discriminating against dwarves and elves. I had a choice between keeping Nilfgaardian laws in place or letting the persecution of non-humans resume. To make the decision tougher, the humans correctly pointed out that dwarves don't let humans live with them in Mahakam. The local humans hated my decision to keep the Nilfgaardian laws in place, as did my army who wanted me to take harsher action against our enemies. Ha! Ha ha! Beautifully knocked those racist knoblickers do not peg! Here, here, dear queen! <laughs> Don't assume you'll be rewarded for your generosity either. More often than not, my leniency led to further deaths. Other decisions included whether or not to execute soldiers for desertion and what to do with a blacksmith who voluntarily made weapons for the enemy but had a history as a good citizen. Should he be executed for making the weapons that killed your soldiers? There's no attempt to keep track of your actions via a morality status or the likes of Paragon and Renegade bars. This frees you up to make whatever decisions you see as appropriate given the circumstances and I took advantage. Queen Meave did more than enough to earn her reputation as a tough leader, however I took mercy when I considered it to be appropriate. Occasionally you can take a middle ground such as having someone whipped instead of executed or released, however that just ends up pissing off everyone. Decisions can have huge ramifications that really pack a punch. On your journey you meet key companions who have powerful cards to use in Gwent and backstories you can uncover via conversations at your campsite. Your actions dictate whether these companions leave the group, betray you or even die. One event that I won't spoil was gloriously understated with a simple line of text and then a pop-up showing the companion's card being removed from my deck. Disputes with companions have added tension due to the importance they have in battle. This aligns the player's motivations to that of Meeves. It's all very well and good taking a firm approach with companions who step out of line but that hampers you in battle later on because you won't have their card. You'll also want to keep companions around because they're incredibly compelling characters. There's Reynard the ever loyal general, Gascon the lovable rogue, Isbel the healer plus a gnome, dwarf and a few more that I won't spoil. Unfortunately there's a bug where you can have conversations with companions about events that have already transpired, so try to clear all the conversation topics when they first become available. For example I had a conversation about the potential fate of a character who had already died. Every character comes to life through phenomenal writing and voice acting that pulls you into the world. I'm a sucker for a Yorkshire accent so Queen Meave is a personal favourite, but it's hard to dislike any of these characters, from the Scottish accented dwarves to the Irish accented residents of Skellige or the appropriately cheeky Gascon. Quite certain of yourself. Many a four you have braided nooses for me, your grace. Yet as you see, my neck's straight as a pike. My threats are never hollow. And if it's an escape you weigh, well, we've yet to see any man abscond from the dungeons of Lyria Castle. I'd hope so. For to be known as second just wouldn't be worth the trouble. Everyone is voice acted, including any commoners you meet, and non spoken dialogue is voiced by the storyteller, who appropriately enough is telling this story over a game of Gwent. The dialogue is of the same high standard as Witcher 3, switching between serious and grim to funny and jovial as the situations allow. Your mother was a hamster, and your father smelled of elderberries! The pleasant surprise is that the descriptive writing is of the same high quality. I suspect that having a narrator makes a huge difference. The writing has to be good if it's going to be read aloud, so I imagine more time was spent on this than usual. Many people, myself included, would love CD Projekt Red to create a game set in the Song of Ice and Fire universe, and Thronebreaker makes me think CD Projekt Red would quite like to do this as well. It's hard to miss the similarities between Queen Meave and Daenerys trying to reclaim their realms, plus Reynard and Jorah Mormont respectively as their advisors who would clearly like to be a lot more than that. The only disappointment with regards to the writing is the lack of prominence given to it in the credits. The lead writer is only mentioned after a few minutes of engineers scrolling past and the senior writer is below the QA team and even the GOG marketing division. Likewise it's a long time before you get the names of the phenomenal voice actors. The writing and voice acting are Thronebreaker's best features so it's a touch disappointing not to see more credit given where due. For a game like this one I'd like to see writers and actors treated similarly to those in movies. CD Projekt Red touts Thronebreaker as having 20 different endings however that seems a bit disingenuous. From my playthrough it looks more like there are 20 different combinations of slides that can appear at the end showing the consequences of your decisions. While I'm curious about the other possibilities it's not quite enough to motivate me to do a second playthrough. That's not meant as a huge negative, I just want to set appropriate expectations. Not all the decisions are a matter of life or death. As you move Queen Meave and her army around the five large overworld maps you collect money, wood and recruits, which you use to make more cards for your Gwent deck. You'll also meet with locals who request help killing monsters, resolving disputes or dealing with bandits. These decisions can be a little tricky. 
Claiming extra resources is useful, especially early on, however you'll also need to worry about the morale of your army. They don't always take too kindly to risking their lives for treasure in a monster-infested cave. These decisions become trivial later on because the costs don't inflate alongside your resources. There's not much of a decision to make when a stranger asks for 50 gold, and you have over 20,000 on hand. While exploring the Northern Realms you'll encounter plenty of mandatory and optional battles and puzzles. If you haven't played Gwent since The Witcher 3 you'll notice a couple of major changes to how these battles play out. Most notably each side now only has two rows instead of three, and the importance of those two rows has been greatly diminished. In the original Gwent the three rows were specifically for melee, ranged and siege weapons. Cards could typically only go on one particular row and you ended up with a layout that resembled an actual battlefield. There were also row specific weather conditions to worry about so choice of row made a huge difference to fights. Gwent now only has two rows and there are no restrictions on where you place the cards. This is the case both for Thronebreaker and the main multiplayer version of Gwent. Battles end up looking a little haphazard which isn't a huge deal I admit but I appreciated the feel of an actual battleground that the original Gwent did a good job in replicating. In the new version you only have to worry about row placement when enemies have cards that get boosts depending on where I place my cards or if I want to use an Arbalist who does more damage depending on how many allies are on a row. Weather conditions are now rare. Enemies rarely use them on you and I never had any in my own deck. You can set enemy rows on fire or add spike traps, however enemies don't often do that to you. I mentioned that Gwent in Witcher 3 could become completely unbalanced, so changes to the formula were clearly needed, it's just a shame these three rows couldn't have been kept. The other major change is that games of Gwent are not necessarily a best of three affair anymore. In fact they are rarely best of three. Instead most battles take place over just one round which removes a huge tactical element, namely having to consider which cards you save for later rounds and when to accept defeat in a round to come back stronger for the next one. There are also a lot of puzzle encounters that require you to meet a specific objective with a fixed deck of cards. These puzzles are brilliant with plenty of variety. I love them. The best ones felt like solving individual logic puzzles where the rule set changes each time. Puzzles include defeating a deranged cow before he can kill normal cows, stopping a wagon escaping and even avoiding an avalanche. These puzzles offer a risk free way to learn how to use cards that you haven't crafted yet and being given a fixed deck stops you worrying about whether your own deck is strong enough to win the fight. You go into each puzzle knowing that you can win. There is a solution right there in front of you so long as you can figure out how to deal with it. There were a couple of puzzles that didn't click for me and I'm fairly sure a couple had a bit of RNG because I completed a puzzle by doing the exact same thing that had failed previously. I just got a bit luckier with where some random damage was distributed. I spent over 5 hours on the first map and loved every minute of it. The story had me hooked and there was so much variety with the Gwent encounters that even as someone who doesn't especially enjoy card collection games I had no desire to skip any of the encounters. The story maintains these high standards until the end. There are twists, betrayals and tough choices all over the place. Unfortunately the games of Gwent ended up getting a bit dull. The puzzles remain challenging however nearly every battle was far too easy. I breezed through most story encounters and barely put any thought into my deck at all. This is a shame because you can build some great decks with satisfying synergy between cards and mix things up to cater to the enemy's strengths and weaknesses. However this is somewhat pointless if you can just throw out cards and win almost by default. I would often go into a battle and make silly mistakes because I hadn't properly understood how a new enemy ability worked or I'd just not been careful enough. I expected to lose and to have to play better next time or maybe craft a new deck, however I would typically win anyway even after making loads of mistakes. Once near the end I had to back out of a fight and change my deck and then won the final round by about 230 to 0. There was only one fight that felt challenging even after I created a new deck specifically for the fight. It's near the end so I won't spoil it but it wasn't so much a difficulty spike as an entirely new experience because until this point I hadn't needed to play with any degree of skill. It felt like I'd gone through the entirety of a Devil May Cry game destroying every enemy just by shooting them and then suddenly on the final boss I had to use the complete moveset to win. It's not an unfair fight necessarily, I would just have appreciated a smoother difficulty curve leading up to this moment and a few more challenges along the way. On that note CD Projekt Red really needs to add in an option to save decks so that you aren't discouraged to change things up when necessary. I've played most of Thronebreaker on normal, however the hard mode doesn't add much of a challenge. Your cards have less power and enemy cards have more power, but when you're winning by over 100 points that isn't a huge deal. I couldn't spot any differences in the AI at different difficulty levels, although it's certainly possible I missed something. As someone who isn't all that experienced with card games, I'm amazed to find myself complaining that the Gwent was too easy. If you've played a lot of the standard multiplayer Gwent or just have experience with card games, Thronebreaker's story is going to be a complete cakewalk even on the hardest difficulty setting. You should still find some challenges with the puzzles though. On easy mode you have the option to skip battles entirely although this choice doesn't appear until you've at least tried each encounter. This is a great way to nudge people into playing normally while also giving them the option to just play the story if that's all they want to do. 
If the card game aspect of Thronebreaker is off-putting, then I'd urge you not to worry about it too much. You can play as much of it as you like and it will never get in the way of you completing the story. Likewise, the visuals might not be your kind of thing, however the artistic style grew on me after the first few hours. On first glance, I unfairly dismissed the graphics because they looked more fitting for a mobile game and I'm not exactly big on them. It does look like a mobile game, but there are some lovely touches that bring the world to life. The first area is probably the worst, so I can understand it not drawing people in. This region is generic fantasy, lots of green grass on a nice sunny day. However, the other four areas are much more appealing with extreme weather conditions, fires and dangerous swamps. You create ripples as you move through the water and Meeve has to brace herself as she walks into strong winds. There are also some lovely shots when the camera pans down slightly to reveal more of the wider world. This all contributes to the world feeling more alive than it would have just from a simple isometric map. Conversations play out in a few different formats. Lengthy paragraphs of narration are delivered via a static screen of text which might have been dull if the narration wasn't so great. It's like being read a bedtime story by Patrick Stewart. Direct conversations usually have the characters conversing on screen, although animations are limited. Finally, there are some glorious comic book style scenes for the important action moments. The card art is also wonderful, with these special cards having layers and some light animation for rain effects and riding a wagon. Short of animating every card and using the comic book style for all the scenes, it's hard to imagine how the artwork could have been improved. It's glorious and brings the world to life almost as much as the large 3D space from the main games. Thronebreaker is worth playing just for the story, especially if you're already a fan of The Witcher and just want more high quality writing set in that world. The story is substantial and contains some cool references to future events that fans will enjoy. In some ways it feels like a spin-off novel or comic series except the writing is of much higher quality. Thronebreaker has an option for multiplayer on the main menu, however this isn't strictly part of the game. If you click on multiplayer, Thronebreaker closes and the main Gwent game opens, assuming you have that installed. Given that they are clearly separate products, I'm not considering Gwent's multiplayer as part of this review, except to mention that you can earn cards in Thronebreaker that you can then use in multiplayer Gwent. These are found by getting maps, which in turn lead to treasure chests. They are not loot boxes. Multiplayer Gwent has paid for packs, but the ones in Thronebreaker cannot be bought with real money, and the rewards are fixed. I've been a touch dismissive of the actual Gwent part of the game, however there are plenty of puzzles that I highly recommend you try out, and the main card games aren't bad as such, they just don't offer much of a challenge. As a result, if you're the opposite to me and care more about card battles than the story, then my recommendation is a lot more tentative. You're probably better off sticking with the main card game and dumping $30 into new packs. CD Projekt Red seems to have aimed for a gentle middle ground between those who play card games and those who don't, but the end result is a lot closer to the casual end of the spectrum. It's a shame because with multiple difficulty settings and the option to skip battles, there should have been enough flexibility to create a challenge for those who want it, while not excluding those who just want the story. I spent 30 hours with Thronebreaker, and while a couple of hours were me moving through the motions of easy Gwent matches, the vast majority saw me hooked to the screen, either listening to the narrator and cast of characters bringing scenes to life, or trying to figure out how to stop spies making it from one end of the Gwent table to the other. If you want a great story set in the Witcher world, then I recommend Thronebreaker. If you enjoyed the video, please do the old like, share and subscribe thing, plus let me know what you thought in the comments. I have a Patreon which gets you in the credits for $1 a month, and there's also a Discord if you want to hang out and chat. I'm working on my video for Mass Effect 2 now, although there might be another review out before then. Until next time, cheers.